No mai haere mai, tēnā koutou katoa. A very warm welcome everybody to this Hermi webinar. Um, we are going to begin in about one minute. But I just wanted to welcome those of you who have arrived. So my name is Talia Kia Rauden. I'm part of the Human Rights Measurement Initiative, or HERMI, as we call ourselves for short. I'm your host for today's conversation as we release brand new human rights data to the world right now. I know people will continue to arrive for another minute or two, so I'll just start with some housekeeping bits and pieces. Please do use the Q&A, the question and answer function to ask questions throughout tonight's presentation. Uh, this session, as you're probably aware, is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after the webinar. Um, of course, none of you will appear in the recording, uh, just those of us who are speaking from the team and our guests. Uh, feel free to view the new data on your own screen as we go through it today. It's live now at rightstracker.org, the brand new 2022 data. And please consider following us on social media. We are at Rights Metrics on Twitter and Facebook. Um, you can find us at Human Rights Measurement Initiative uh, on LinkedIn, and those links will be in the chat box throughout uh, the presentation also. Uh, we are very glad to have you all with us today drawn together by a common commitment to making our world better, kinder and fairer. Today I'm coming to you from Wellington, New Zealand, and I know we have people with us from all over the world, uh, particularly in Asia and the Pacific, Africa and Europe, where it's normal awake time. A very warm welcome to you all. We can't see all your faces, but we'd like to start by inviting you to respond to this poll, asking what part of the world you're in or from. And of course, this is optional, but perhaps um, if you can tell us what part of the world, what region of the world you're from, um, we will be able to uh, feel a little closer to you um, across, across the far distances. watching the numbers go up in real time. This is exciting. Oh, we are quite spread out. Well, welcome to all of you. Now also with me today are several members of the Hermi team and four special invited guests. Let me just go through the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to start um, in a moment, one of our team from South Asia, who's going to be anonymous to the wider world for their safety, is going to take you on a tour through the new data on the rights tracker, focusing to start with on the brand new scores produced for the first time this year for India and China. And I'm just having trouble moving my cursor because of the poll results. So excuse me just a moment while I find my way. Um, then that same South Asia team member will invite responses to India's and China's scores from our guests. Uh, we have um, four guests with us today, uh, two to share their views on the India data. We have Mansi, who is a social justice lawyer and public policy professional, and also another anonymous commentator from that part of the world. We'll also be joined by two experts on China, uh, Simon Chang from Hong Kong is in Britain and Benedict Rogers of Hong Kong Watch. Then we'll chat with our own Hermi civil and political rights metrics experts. We have uh, Dr. K. Chad Clay, our methodology research and design lead, who will take an overview of global trends and headlines. And our new civil and political rights metrics lead, Matt Rains, will pick out some big stories from our people at risk and qualitative data. And we'll close the prepared part of today's session with a short conversation with Hermi co-founder, Anne-Marie Brooke, about some exciting new directions and who we hope to see using our human rights data 
to improve people's lives. Now, today we're talking mainly about civil and political rights around the world. Um, we have another event in a week's time focusing on our economic and social rights. Uh, so if that is an area of interest for you, I encourage you to register for that event also. Today, thinking about civil and political rights, I wanted to begin with a picture of what we're all working towards. This is my daughter, Hazel, many years ago when she was about seven months old. And long before I joined Hermie, this is not a Hermie specific story. This is me and her at her first political protest uh, in support of increasing paid parental leave in New Zealand, it was. There were lots of other babies and parents all gathering in support of proposed legislation. It was a fun morning. Now, we at Hermie and many of you all around the world are working towards a world where everyone is as free and safe as Hazel and these other babies were in that moment. Hazel and I were able to gather with others. We had freedom of assembly and association. And I'm just gonna show you some of the icons for the rights that we use on our rights tracker for the civil and political rights that we measure. So we had freedom of assembly and association. We raised our voices to argue for what we thought would make the world better. We used our freedom of opinion and expression. We engaged in the political process. And crucially, we could do those things safely. Lucky us. And this is what human rights are about. Everyone in the world should be able to protest anything and have that cloak of safety. Because I was fairly sure that morning, strapping Hazel into the front pack and popping her little green hat on her head, that we would be safe from arbitrary arrest and detention. That no one would forcibly disappear us for speaking our minds. We no longer have the death penalty at all in my country, so I didn't even have to turn my mind to that risk, thanks to decades of hard work by human rights defenders here and internationally. Extrajudicial execution and torture and ill treatment are things that protesters in many countries have to worry about. And in New Zealand, where I am, other people are sadly much more at risk than white people or Pakia people like me and my daughter. But in that moment, there was no risk to our multicultural, peaceful political gathering. And this is what we're working towards, a world where no matter what country we're in, and no matter what our political allegiances, and for all people who are part of cultural, ethnic, religious, or other minorities, we and our babies are always empowered to participate in political life. And we are always safe from harm from the state. Today, we are releasing new measurements of how true that is so far, in around 31 countries. The 2022 data are now live on rightstracker.org. We at Hermie produce robust numbers showing how well governments treat people. We publish all our data on the rights tracker. They're freely available to anyone in the world to use. Now we'd like to show you a short video now, an animated explanation of how and why we measure civil and political rights. You can find it on our YouTube channel later if you'd like to see it again, and we'll put the link in the chat box. So now I'm going to pass over to my colleague Yo-Yo to play the video. Human rights keep people safe and let them flourish. How do we tell if all countries are respecting people's rights and allowing them to flourish? If we want leaders to prioritize human rights, we need to measure them. What gets measured gets improved. Leaders of countries love numbers. What's GDP growth this quarter? How many people have jobs? The Human Rights Measurement Initiative, HERMI, is filling a gap in the human rights ecosystem. We use robust and peer-reviewed methodologies to track the human rights performance of countries and publish scores each year on our rights tracker. We are shining a light on human rights. 
We want countries to care so much about human rights that leaders call in their advisors and ask what they need to do to get their scores up. Civil and political rights, like voting rights, free speech, and freedom from torture and ill treatment, haven't been measured comprehensively until now, partly because it's unpopular with governments and partly because of the desk drawer problem. People with accurate knowledge about, say, how many people were tortured last year often have bulging desk drawers, but lots of the cases they know about don't end up being published or counted. Maybe there isn't enough funding, or their organization has different priorities right now. So we go straight to those local experts in each country, and we ask them about the rights we measure, given all the information in their desk drawers. We want to produce reliable scores that are comparable between different people across different countries over time. So we use a carefully designed, anonymous and secure online questionnaire to find out what's really going on in each country. We ask about what people have observed in their country and also about fictional countries so we can place everyone's answers on the same scale. Then we act as a megaphone amplifying the voices of all of those local researchers, campaigners, human rights lawyers and journalists. Our megaphone turns their combined desk drawer knowledge into scores out of 10 for each country, displayed and freely available to the worldonrightstracker.org. We display scores within certainty bands. The narrower the band, the more certain we are of the score. We also ask everyone which kinds of people are at extra risk of having their rights violated. So you can search the rights tracker to explore the human rights situation for, say, refugees, or women and girls, or journalists, or people who are homeless. Please use your country's scores to advocate for the changes you want. Show your leaders the numbers and where they need to improve. Congratulate them when you see the scores go up. We publish annual updates each year, usually in June. Go to rightstracker.org to see how your country is doing. You can also get in touch if you want us to bring the survey to your country or if you can help fund us to keep producing these data and expand our coverage. In today's world, change needs numbers and we are producing them because human rights keep people safe and let them flourish. The Human Rights Measurement Initiative, measuring what matters. Thanks, Yo-Yo, and you can see that video at any time on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm now going to invite one of our South Asia Hermi team members to take us on a guided tour through the new scores for India and China. So over to you, friend. Thank you, Talia. A warm welcome once again. We're so delighted to be able to share our scores uh, with all of you. Uh, one of the key developments for Hermi this year was the expansion of our human rights expert survey that you just saw uh, to India and China, the two largest countries in the world by population. This basically means that now on the rights tracker this year, we will have scores for civil and political rights for these two countries freely available to all. Now, before we take a tour of the rights tracker to understand the scores, uh, we would like to offer a heartfelt gratitude to the many people in and around these two countries, as well as our other survey countries who shared our knowledge with us this year, sometimes even in the most difficult circumstances. It's your contribution that has enabled us to produce these data. Uh, we will now briefly take you through our findings for the two new entrants to our rights tracker, India followed by China. So I will just share my screen. Uh, I hope all of you can see my screen now. Uh, when you go to rightstracker.org, you will come to our main web page where you will see or you will be able to navigate our rights tracker and all the information and data that we have through these various menus. However, most commonly, people just use the search bar here to look for the country or the right that they are most interested in, uh, they're most interested in finding more information about. And since we are first looking at the India scores, I will type and click India here. 
this brings us to the india page which presents a, an overall picture of the human rights landscape in india this gives us an overview of all the different scores that we have for all the different rights that we measure for india on the same page uh for your in, for just for your information homi measures around 13 different rights which we have clubbed in three separate categories uh you can click on these category tabs here for more information on these categories or each rights in these categories for this session we will be skipping the quality of life rights as thalia mentioned they will be launched separately in a webinar next week uh before we go to the civil and political rights uh scores just a couple of things using this download pdf button you can obtain a pre formatted pdf of this overview of india's scores uh that you can use in your advocacy uh similarly uh before we go ahead we'll just keep in mind the methodology video that uh, thalia just shared and just a couple of things before we delve into the scores to understand the scores better uh the cpr scores for india and the other countries that we've published are basically data measuring how things were in india or other survey countries in the recently completed year that is 2021 uh we go to human rights practitioners in our survey countries including india and ask them how things were and what the extent of violations were for that year our team then processes the responses received and subjects them to a statistical analysis which are then presented in the form of scores out of 10 uh, a unique thing about homi is that we present our scores within what we call certainty bands and the rationale underlying this is that uh, we want to be absolutely transparent about the level of certainty that we have about these scores for example you can see here that the summary score for safety from the state for india is a 4.6 out of 10 and lies within the range of 3.6 and 5.6 uh we can also scroll down to see the score for each of these five individual rights that form the safety from the state category uh let's say for example freedom from arbitrary arrest with a score of 4.3 within this range or let's say freedom from torture and ill treatment which has a score of 3.9 within this range uh another additional aspect is just to provide a general indication of how to read or understand the scores we have uh, divided the scores into different performance ranges now these are not comprehensive descriptions of of a country's performance but just indicative of how the performance can generally be understood we can see here that the that four out of the five safety from the state scores for india fall in what we call the bad range uh a notable fact is that the death penalty the score for freedom from death penalty is at a 10 which means in 2021 this particular right uh, india respected the freedom from uh, death penalty for people uh before we scroll down here is a button you can click uh which will help you underst to understand and interpret the scores within the uncertainty bands uh we often have a running joke within our homi team which says that the rights tracker is so interactive that if you have any questions just click on something that you want to know more about and you will have a pop up that will explain uh, how to read those scores when we scroll further down we get an overtime trend of the five rights that form the safety from the state uh in the survey that we ran this year we asked our human rights experts from india and china specifically to provide us information for events in both 2020 as well as 2021 and we see a slight variation or a slight shift uh in terms of respect for these rights over these two years uh we will now scroll down to what is one of the most uh interesting aspects of the survey we ask our respondents to identify the people or groups of people uh who according to them were at risk of certain civil and political rights being violated in that particular year uh you can see the word clouds here in which these people groups are mentioned for example you can select this any particular right from these five safety from the state rights or uh, to see which people were at risk of those rights being violated so we can let's say select freedom from torture and ill treatment and you will see the word clouds now when these groups are mentioned here it basically means that at least one of our respondents have picked these people to be 
at particular risk of being this right violated so we also see that certain groups are uh, in a larger text than others this only means that more percentage of our human rights experts or respondents have identified these people to be at greater risk we can also click on a particular group to see how many percentage of our experts have identified them to be at risk so we can see human rights advocates who are at risk of torture and ill treatment and 54% of our experts have identified them similarly we can go ahead with indigenous people and say that 46% of our experts have identified indigenous people as being at risk of being tortured and ill treated when we scroll further down we have more additional information that our survey respondents have provided in their own words uh, and that we've summarized here for uh, for your benefit uh, this basically provides greater context or background for the people or groups that they selected at be as being at risk for various rights violations now this could be in the form of particular communities or type of people this could refer to particular events or even particular geographic situations so this information basically gives a backdrop to the safety from the uh, to the people at risk uh, of violations from the safety from the state rights now having understood the basics of how to generally read these rights will quickly glance over to the empowerment rights score the overview shows us that for 2021 the summary score for empowerment rights in india was 4.5 we see that out of the three scores two scores were almost on the cusp of the bad and the very bad range whereas only one score lies in what we uh, have have categorized as a fair range uh, so basically what we can understand that the lower the score is on 10 many people are unable or are restricted from enjoying these rights similarly when we scroll down we see the overtime trend for each of these three rights over 2020 and 2021 uh, we can also see the word clouds for people at risk we can select any right that we wish click on any particular group of people to see how many of our human rights experts identified them to be at risk and we can further scroll down to have more information and context in terms of the people at risk data now we will go to the people at risk category tab here we have already seen the word clouds for different rights however on this page you will see that the word clouds for people at risk are all clubbed together for all the different rights that we measure for india uh, using this drop down menu you can select any particular group and it will be pre highlighted for you Uh, under various rights and this will basically show you the trend on uh, which rights of the said group were identified to be at risk or where they lie uh, on the word crowd as uh, clouds as identified are by our experts so since we have selected indigenous people as we scroll down we see where how indigenous people or which rights were they at risk of being violated uh, similarly we can also click on this button here to find that additional contextual information that we spoke about in order to give more context of which were the kinds of people that were at risk uh this is basically the a run through a quick run through of the india scores will now quickly glance over the china scores so we can click on the countries button here and type china and voila there we go uh on the at a glance page we also find an overview of china scores just a uh, reminder that you can download this overview or a summary snapshot of china scores using this button in a pre uh, formatted view when we go to safety from the state category for china we see that the summary score is a 2.8 within the uncertainty band and it falls in the very bad range uh, for each of the five rights that form this category we also see that most of them fall within this range except possibly extra judicial execution uh another thing to notice is that the uncertainty bands here are rather tight or narrow which could mean that either we've had more respondents responding to these questions or it also means that there was a greater agreement or similarity in the responses given by the human rights experts who took the survey we also see here that the lowest score for china is on the right to freedom from death penalty which is a 1 out of 10 similar uh, just as we saw for india we can scroll down to see uh, other information highlighting overtime trends we can see word clouds for people at risk for 
the different rights under this category. And we also see the additional information that basically provides a backdrop of the people who were identified to be at risk by our respondents. Going over to the empowerment rights score, we see that China has a score of 2.1 within the band of 1.2 and 2.9. All the three rights under empowerment category fall uh, somewhere around the very bad range. Uh, we scroll down to see similar information as well as word clouds for people at risk. Uh, you can basically hover over any of these uh, uh, things and click on them to find more information. On the right hand side, we have frequently asked questions with respect to the methodology and how to read this course. Uh, an additional aspect on the China page this year is an additional tab that we call behind the numbers. Now this tab gives you a further interpretative analysis on our findings on China uh, using the contextual information that was provided by our respondents using some important infographic as well as a comparison of China's scores to its other East Asian counterparts that we ran our survey in. Our team will be speaking more about this later during the session. But this is just a quick reminder that just like the overview, you can also download this behind the buttons page using uh, in a PDF format here. Now, before we conclude the tour, uh, let me take you uh, through another interesting way of seeing how India and China have performed on the civil and political rights. You can click on the rights menu here and you can basically select a category of rights or even individual rights to see how countries that we have run the survey in or we have the data for have performed on those rights. For example, let me select empowerment rights here. It shows the scores for 30 countries uh, for 2021, which the summary score for empowerment rights are basically lined up in a descending order within their uncertainty bands. For India and China, we have to scroll down to the bottom almost to see where India is at a 4.5 and where China is at a 2.1. Uh, just, just for a, a comparison purpose, uh, when, whenever there is an overlap in the uncertainty band, for example, we look at Hong Kong and China, uh, we would not say that Hong Kong is doing better in empowerment rights at 2.5 than China at 2.1. And the reason is that their uncertainty bands significantly overlap. However, we can, for example, say that Malaysia, which has a lower range of 3.7, is doing better than China, which has an upper range of 2.9, since there are no overlap uh, between these uncertainty bands. Uh, you can use such comparison or using different rights and on India, China, or any other country that basically interests you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I understand that this was a lot of information to unpack. So this is just a quick reminder for you to use the Q&A button uh, and ask us as many questions as you want. Uh, this is also a quick reminder that we will have newer videos of Right Stacker Tours coming up on our YouTube channel over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Uh, so thank you for your patience with what was a rather clinical aspect of understanding these scores. Uh, but the good news is that we'll now move to a more responsive and interactive part of this session. For us at Hermi, it is absolutely important that our findings and data uh, add value to the work of human rights activists and advocates on the ground and allows them to better engage with their governments to improve the lives of people in their countries. And it is with that intention that we have guest experts on India as well as China, who will now share their comments and views on our newly uh, launched data for these two countries. I am absolutely thrilled and honored to introduce our panelists. First, we have with us Mansi, who's a social justice lawyer and public policy professional from India. She runs a citizen engagement initiative and also works on issues at the intersection of technology and warfare. Uh, we have another experienced researcher uh, who will be commenting on India's scores, uh, who has been working on the intersectional developmental issues as well as minority rights across India and South Asia. They will remain anonymous. Then we have with us Simon Cheng. Simon is a Hong Kong exiled pro-democracy activist and founder of Hong Kong diasporic nonprofit organization, Hong Kongers in Britain, which is headquartered in central London. 
And our final panelist is Benedict Rogers, a human rights activist and co-founder of Hong Kong Watch. He's also a senior analyst for East Asia with CSW and is on the advisory boards of several organizations, including the Interparliamentary Alliance on China and the Stop Uyghur Genocide Campaign. As an Asia specialist, he has written for many uh, international media portals and has authored seven books, including on Myanmar and China. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we are all really keen to listen to your reflections on the scores and to see what you think of them. So without any further ado, I will first go to our guest experts on India. Uh, both of you have had a chance to look at the comprehensive scores and data for India. So my first question to you would be, what is it in the new data or civil and political rights findings for India that particularly stands out for both of you? Uh, Mansi, let me first come to you for your response. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I think for um, those of us who have been witnessing firsthand the contraction of spaces for exercising civil and political rights in India, particularly in the last couple of years, uh, the data and findings are not surprising. Rather, I think they are more or less along expected lines. So we now know through numbers what we knew intuitively that was happening in the country. Uh, persecution in name of religion, caste, region, language, food habits, clothing um, continues, unfortunately continues unabated in India. Uh, prodded by the fringe elements uh, who in turn are emboldened by the silence of the state. But even then, I think it is alarming that all survey respondents overwhelmingly identify human rights advocates as, um, as at particular risk of state excesses, followed by people of particular religious beliefs, caste, indigenous people, and particularly people living in certain regions of India. So, um, so in a lot of survey responses, uh, Jammu and Kashmir or people living in Kashmir have been identified as being at particular risk. Uh, and even people living in Northeast part of the country and those who are living in the tribal belts uh, where indigenous populations uh, exist, they have also been identified as being at particular risk. Unfortunately, these people have lived under the shadow of conflict for a very long time now, and that has also become uh, an excuse for the state to commit excesses. And um, I think cutting across all of these um, identities are, of course, women who are always doubly and in some cases triply disadvantaged. So I think as far as the data and findings are concerned, um, it, it, um, it, it puts into perspective and numbers what we have been seeing around us for the last couple of years. Thank you for your response, Mansi. It's very interesting that you say that the data basically uh, puts, a, puts an image to what human rights advocates in India have always intuitively known. I will go to our other commentator from India, uh, would you have similar experiences as our first guest? And what do you think is uh, a part of the data that is the most striking to you? Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, firstly, congratulations to the uh, Burmi team for this fabulous uh, uh, initiative. And uh, as uh, our, our previous uh, uh, guest uh, mentioned, uh, the data uh, that you're publishing today is a validation of what we've been seeing uh, through our own experiences. Um, but again, as uh, I think uh, is the whole point of this exercise, uh, numbers, uh, performance, uh, quantitative uh, stuff uh, provides human rights advocates, activists with further tools to to challenge, in a sense, uh, the silence of the state or uh, the fact that the state uh, denies uh, 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 the violations taking place. So this is, this is in a sense, helps uh, all of us uh, in our own uh, little advocacy uh, worlds. In terms of data, uh, again, uh, echoing uh, what, what the previous guest uh, mentioned, um, uh, 
validation. Money. I think I think, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm looking at the at the aggregate, uh, the headline sort of uh, figures. Uh, um, nothing surprising on safety from the state. Uh, it's good to know the death penalty uh, because uh, <clears throat> uh, the country is taking that seriously. Uh, there is some positive uh, showing there, uh, but in terms of arbitrary arrest, uh, absolutely. Uh, every second day, forced disappearances uh, a bit better, but, but this would be particularly high in specific geographies. I can think of uh, Jammu and Kashmir and other places, uh, Central India. Uh, extrajudicial ex execution, again, uh, a, a, a very common pattern, uh, not just in specific geographies, but also uh, episodically uh, when people are protesting, uh, protesting uh, peacefully against uh, very discriminatory laws and policies. Large numbers of people killed uh, by the police uh, in excessive use of force. Uh, torture and ill treatment uh, happens every day in the country. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, uh, particularly uh, we're seeing a, a pattern over the past years against protesters, uh, et cetera. Now, come uh, across all of these, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, categories, I'm, I'm sorry about my throat, uh, uh, but uh, across all these categories, I think what we're seeing is particularly uh, the point about uh, uh, groups at risk. You find a lot of this happening against specific groups as your data uh, uh, makes it very clear. Uh, human rights defenders, uh, but particularly we are seeing in over the past two, three years, uh, religious minorities, Muslims particularly, you see a lot of this uh, across the board from arbitrary arrest to uh, forced disappearances, uh, extrajudicial executions, torture, et cetera, happening in, very, in different geographies, particularly where Muslims are in concentration. Uh, so we'll have that in uh, you know, uh, provinces like Uttar Pradesh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Assam. Increasingly, okay. seeing a bit of this happening in uh, places like uh, Karnataka, etc. Okay. Um, right. Uh, moving on, empowerment. Uh, again, assembly and association, opinion and expression. Yes, pretty much bang on. Uh, participation in government. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, the figure, well, qualitatively, say it's fair. Uh, the number is 6.8. Now, I think this is where a bit of disaggregation would be helpful. So whilst you could say that this is this might be true for specific groups, and I have uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and, and, and women in mind here, uh, you know, indigenous communities, uh, caste minorities. When it comes to religious minorities, again, participation is pretty much, will, will be pretty, pretty low. Uh, and specifically if you look at Muslims again, I mean, just to give you a very, well, a, 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 a little flavor of what it is like in elected bodies, national parliament, uh, state assemblies across the yeah. country. The ruling party has no Muslim uh, member at all now. Uh, now that is really, really al alarming because anything that you want to do in terms of advocacy, in terms of changing the patterns of yeah. safety from the state, you need people to be able to participate. You need, uh, you need minorities to be there in police forces, in civil, so uh, in civil services, in elected bodies, as decision makers, right. to be able to make those choices. Uh, th that figure is extremely low. So going forward, it will be great to see some disaggregation there uh, by specific groups, especially, uh, especially uh, mm, uh, vulnerable groups. I'll just conclude by saying, well, uh, basically step, stepping back a bit and saying, so the figures are pretty bad, right? Uh, and the big puzzle for, for, for all of us should be, how come such bad showing in a country that's the largest democracy, uh, that claims to set to the last, largest democracy, that is the largest democracy, uh, and, yeah. and yet you have such bad showing. And, and that is the big, big, uh, well, surprise, if I, if I may yeah. say, uh, so that, that jumps out at people. Uh, the figures for people who are familiar with what's happening on the ground, uh, this is no surprise, but I think the surprising bit is that this is happening in a country that's the largest democracy. Now, the advocacy challenge for all of us is how does the state respond to your findings, the data? Uh, will it uh, engage constructively? Will it try yeah. to uh, learn from this? Will it try to uh, take these uh, you know, figures and data and opinions and the and the analysis seriously and try to see uh, if uh, improvements can be made? Now, that that if it is serious about its obligations, 
uh, to human rights, uh, both, uh, uh, you know, commitments made uh, in constitution, laws, etc., but also international obligations. Uh, maybe that is that that is one one sort of pathway, or will it, as we've seen repeatedly, will it push back against uh, yet another uh, uh, yet another uh, sort so, sort of uh, set of findings, yet another expression of of of, of the rot uh, uh, there through uh, uh, reprisals against human rights defenders, you and I, or uh, disinformation. Uh, or, or plain bluster, uh, saying no. This is all. This is this is all. Uh, you know, uh, figures uh, pulled from the air, and and we continue to be independent and and uh, you know uh, uh, democratic, and you know we we respect right. uh, uh, freedom, etc. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Right. So thank you for your very insightful response. I also saw that towards the end of uh, your or your time, you also had a message uh, or a call for the government whether it would take the findings uh, seriously and engage constructively on them or would there be a pushback? Uh, Mansi, do you have any uh, any such parting thoughts or message for the government of India, just like our other uh, guest expert commented? Yes, um, I think just as the, the video that we just saw mentioned that um, one of the reasons why this, you know, the, the civil and political rights, particularly data on voting rights and uh, state excesses and ill treatment haven't been uh, measured so far is because it's unpopular with the governments. So I think it will be it will be uh, the government's reaction to this data or findings uh, would also be along expected lines. Um, most likely there will be denial. There will be an attack on the methodology, uh, the intentions and ideology of those who have undertaken this who who have designed the survey or participated in it, all of that will be questioned. Uh, but I hope that for once, you know, because as we saw in the video itself, that human rights are important to let people flourish. So I hope in 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 the in the pursuit of that, we will be able to rise above uh, the the politics around uh, the, the data and findings and that the government will see it as a challenge uh, on, uh, on aspects that needs to be improved upon and uh, use these numbers uh, you know, for and uh, setting a target, uh, perhaps a very ambitious tar target to improve upon right. and uh, to respect for human rights and with an understanding that this will be good for overall improvement in lives. Um, and it's an investment that uh, has high returns and and multiplying effects. Um, but also, I think an understanding that what these numbers show is that there is an alienation um, that some communities, particularly uh, who are being persecuted on the basis of their identity, are feeling. Um, and uh, if this alienation is continued to persist, this is likely to have um, negative impact on the society. It will breed distrust, unrest in society to a point that it will become difficult to handle the consequences after a point right. of time. So not only do these numbers need to improve, but respect for human rights um, needs to become an integral part of state's interaction. Uh, with its people. And uh, of course, um, you know, I mean, beyond the numbers, a healing touch is perhaps required because we are talking about human lives here who are being uh, subjected to state excesses. Um, so with that, I, I hope that these numbers are taken in the right spirit and acted upon. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing uh, your insights with us. Uh, we truly hope, like Pansi mentioned, a healing touch going beyond the numbers is what needs to improve the lives of people. So we truly hope that the data that we produce becomes useful uh, or as a useful tool for the civil society in the country to continue to engage with the government and for the government to take the data, uh, to take a look at the data and I say this especially in light of the upcoming Universal Periodic Review for India later this uh, year. Uh, with that, I think I will now quickly turn to our human rights experts on China. Uh, Simon, Ben, thank you very much for your patience and for joining us. Just like uh, we asked our guest experts on India, you have also had access to China scores and findings. 
uh, I'd like to know what uh, stood out the most for you. So Simon, I'll first come to you uh, for you to share your thoughts based on your own work and experience. What in the data stood out the most to you? Yes, um, thank you so much for, for the Hermit. Um, I think that, first of all, when I um, see the result, it's actually quite uh, down on earth uh, to reflect the reality of what I have seen um, in Hong Kong and in China. Um, I think apparently that what stood out is about the political rights that is going to be worse uh, and worse recently. Um, I think also that we we could see that's the safety from the states, that's the public confidence of the safety from the states if they've been, you know, involved in any activities relevant to, um, you know, the um, 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 criticism of the government or those people in power, then they will feel unsafe. So that's the result is pretty well expected, especially after the um, national security law has been imposed a few years ago. So um, I also um, think that's impressed me about the right tracker is because that the, um, you differentiate um, two different category uh, of the political and civil rights, which first of all is safety from the state and second is empowerment. Then I think it's quite important to make this lie clear because what we can see in Hong Kong, the safety from the state is slightly higher score than the empowerment. I think it's just because the safety from the state will be more defensive, which means that how could you feel at least say that you can hold your freedom tight in your hometown. But for example, empowerment, that's more progressive that to see your rights that you could vote for anyone that's in the government or that you have more proactive uh, rights to assert your political opinions or expression, et cetera. So it make really it make really sense that when we say, you know, in Hong Kong, that that's still a certain freedom, but it's been to tell bit by bit and gonna be worse and worse. But empowerment for a long, long time that we wanna fight for a full democracy for political rights that we can get universal suffrage, can get one person one vote for our political leader, um, but it's always being uh, unsatisfied. And also um, at the moment under this constitution is unachie unachievable. So I think this kind of thing would reflect why we would see that's the safety from the state um, and empower empowerment that would be um, different um, criteria and you know that's a different type of score that we have seen and of course that quality of life I think it's also important that we could take into the consideration which is also a core part of human rights as economic and social rights although that we could see uh, in China that is going to be um, improving and also in Hong Kong, that is a pretty high score as well. It's better than average based on the rice tracker, Hermit. Um, however, I would see that would be affected bit by bit when the people, they still cannot achieve democracy or even that they feel unsafe. Right. We already have seen that brain drain to happen and it would affect the quality of life bit by bit. That is a bit harder to solve about the long stand issue uh, of housing and also the social social inequality. So I think that would be a bit by bit will affect even the quality of life in the future. So um, thanks for this, because from my perspective, uh, for example, when I've been just uh, attend some human rights uh, meeting in Geneva, relevant to the United Nations Human Rights Council, and uh, Human Rights uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur. I think this kind of the data uh, would be more scientific to provide to civil servants, officials, and international organization to see, you know, the, um, the, 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 um, um, the criteria that what we should see, how right. better that they could improve. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Simon. 
uh, Ben, uh, I now come to you. And uh, again, this question to you is in the context of your new book that is due to be published later this year on which, which will speak a lot more about China. Uh, what in the data did you find most striking or did you see any congruence between your own research and work and our, our new data? Over to you, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I mean, I agree very much with what Simon has said. Uh, and I think that the data is not a surprise, I think, to anyone working on, on China and, and Hong Kong, um, but it does very much uh, reinforce and, and confirm what we know kind of more anecdotally. Uh, and I think the fact that, uh, particularly in terms of safety, of, uh, uh, safety from the state and, and civil and political rights, uh, China is very clearly uh, one of the very worst performers in the world. And I think seeing that um, uh, measured in the way that you've measured it, uh, rather than just through uh, anecdotal and testimonial evidence, uh, is, um, is very valuable. I think one of the things that particularly comes through um, is that although um, uh, I, th I think uh, the situation in China has become more and more uh, repressive across the board over the last decade uh, under Xi Jinping, um, particularly intense uh, repression, it, it affects um, uh, ethnic and religious uh, minorities. And we've certainly seen what I would say is the worst uh, crackdown on freedom of religion or belief, um, particularly for Christians, uh, really since the Cultural Revolution. And then, of course, with the situation in Xinjiang for the Uyghurs, uh, which both uh, the previous and the current U.S. administrations, uh, several parliaments and an independent tribunal, the Uyghur tribunal, have all uh, concluded am amounts to genocide. Uh, I think the, uh, the fact that religious and ethnic uh, minorities are highlighted as, as most at risk, along with, of course, dissidents and human rights defenders, um, is, very, is very striking. Um, and I think that um, one of the other things I would... Uh, highlight, I know the focus uh, in this discussion is particularly on China, but having looked at the Hong Kong data as well, uh, is the fact that, uh, uh, again, empowerment is, uh, is so low in Hong Kong, and that really reflects the dramatic deterioration and dismantling of Hong Kong's freedoms uh, in, in recent years. So um, I think I'll leave it at that for now, but I, I think it just really confirms what, uh, what we already know, um, and I hope it, it can be used uh, to, to persuade policymakers around the world uh, to think about how they respond. Right, uh, thank you for your response. I, I do see a large consonance in the responses of almost all our guest experts. Now, if you were to just sum up your thoughts, what would your call to the Chinese government or to the world at large be based on the data that you've seen? Uh, what, like, just to sum up your thoughts briefly. Uh, Simon, would you like to go first? Um, um, I, I think that's the... Um... This kind of the scientific, um, at, at least I would say that's more, um, that's data could give a very clear signal to okay. all, you know, the sovereign states that they, they can't really say that there has, with different standards in different country. That's also what the Chinese foreign ministry always claim that they have their own standard of the human rights. Okay. Um, I think that's we, which we should use this kind of the index and Mm -hmm. uh, things will be more systematic and coordinate. We're not leaned on any one like um, 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 block of the nations or we're not standing in any one national interest to say anything. We don't okay. want to be regarded as like a pound in the international uh, relations or in the chessboard or something that has always been the blame game between several great powers and is also what China's always that they would say, oh, that is politicized, that is what the West would be okay. stigmatized me or something. Um, mm -hmm. But by profiling this kind of index, we have been very fairly criticized if there has any true uh, human rights violation around the world. Even we could see United Kingdom, United States, in other country, we also could see that would be some worrying signals that we need to face and address. Okay. Um, so 
um, to China as well. But we, we do feel that the scale is different. We know mm -hmm. that, you know, human rights, you know, the situation around the world is not perfect, but it still have some rooms to improve. And we honestly and generally see China is still a bit lower than average, that they yeah. should improve. I think that would be important that if we escalate it to the United Nations, that's more recognizable, more independent, more impartial uh, data for them to take it as a reference for the future reports that they could submit. Thank you. Right. Uh, Benedict, I come to you for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, just picking up on uh, Simon's point about the United Nations, I, I very much hope that uh, even though she is uh, leaving office uh, later this year, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, will take this data very seriously. Um, she was recently in China, as many of you will know, and uh, in my view, um, she didn't handle her visit to China in the way that I would have hoped uh, her to. Um, but I hope when she sees this data that will uh, remind her just how serious the situation is. Um, but if I may, just very briefly, I, I think I'd um, have three recommendations for policymakers around the world um, in light of this, this data. Um, the first is that I, I think, uh, well, I, overall, I think countries should completely rethink uh, our approach to China. Uh, and there are th three things I think they should do. The first is, um, uh, to, uh, and the US has done this, but I think others should, uh, to impose uh, targeted sanctions on those responsible for human rights violations, individuals in the Chinese government and uh, Chinese companies and entities complicit with, with violations. I, I think if, they, if there is no penalty for uh, the uh, very grave human rights violations that the regime is perpetrating, then it will just be emboldened to become e even more repressive. Um, the second thing I think governments around the world should do is to really um, extend uh, what I call lifeboat uh, policies to enable those who need to get out uh, to do so and to find sanctuary uh, around the world. That's been done to a certain extent for Hong Kongers, um, although there's more that could be done, but I think there's also more that could be done to help Uyghurs and Chinese Christians, Tibetans, Chinese dissidents. Um, and then the third thing that I, I hope uh, governments will think about um, is for those governments that still have extradition agreements with either China or Hong Kong, uh, I hope they will uh, think about uh, 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 suspending or, or cancelling those agreements, particularly when the data shows, I, I, if I've got this correct, that, it's, that China is the lowest in the world uh, in terms of the death penalty. Um, and so the high risk of extraditing people to China um, where they could face either the death penalty uh, or, or very serious forms of torture, uh, that risk is very high. And, and I would apply that uh, certainly to political cases, but, it, but even to genuine criminal cases. Um, it, it's ironic that many countries that uh, don't have the death penalty, particularly in Europe, still have extradition agreements with China where people uh, could face the, the death penalty. So those would be my recommendations for governments to, to think about. and. Um, I think this data really uh, reinforces the message I've been trying to put out for some years, along with many friends and colleagues, that we need to um, completely rethink our relationship with not the people of China, but the regime of China. Right. So uh, I think we'll have to, I think this is a much larger conversation, but thank you so much to all of you for sharing your reflections and insights with us. I take the liberty of speaking on behalf of my team here and I say that we admire and are so grateful for the work that all of you do. And we certainly hope that our data is useful and relevant for your work, as well as for the work of our wider human rights practitioners community to continue to do what they do to engage, advocate, and ensure respect for human rights for all. Uh, while we conclude this panel, uh, our Hermi team is waiting to share some other really interesting uh, insights, findings, and trends with all of you. I will now hand the reins of this webinar back to Thalia. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you so much to all our guest speakers. We, we really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us. 
Um, now we're going to circle out from China and India um, and, and back towards them uh, shortly. But we're going to start now by looking at other trends and headlines from the new civil and political rights data. So I'd like to introduce our methodology research and design lead, Dr. K. Chad Clay from the University of Georgia in the United States. But you're not in the US right now, are you, Chad? Yeah, that's right, Taya. Um, currently at the National University of Ireland uh, in Galway, uh, leading a University of Georgia study away program. Uh, where we're aiming to teach students about uh, human rights in the European Union and dissent and repression uh, in the context of the Troubles uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and those students are actually in the audience today. Uh, so you know, we're all very, very pleased to, to have the opportunity to participate um, in this conversation and to introduce the world to Hermes' latest data release. Oh, that's great. It's always great to have your students with us. Welcome. Um, now, Chad, you have eaten, drunk, slept and breathed these data over the last couple of months. Um, what interesting trends and patterns and headlines have you spotted that you'd like to talk about? So, you know, as is the case in most years, there's there's more stories in the data than we could possibly ever cover. Um, but a few things do, do stand out to me. Um, I'll start with some positive news. Uh, it would appear that the, the global decline in civil and political rights that we observed in the wake of the COVID pandemic in 2020, uh, which was detailed, we, we wrote a special report just last year about this uh, um, that we released around this time. Uh, you can find it on the website. Um, but it seems that that decline uh, due to COVID may have stalled uh, in 2021, which is good news. Um, you know, it I don't want to overstate the good news. It doesn't really appear that we regained all of the losses we suffered in 2020, uh, but the decreases in respect for civil and political rights in 2021 were just much, much rarer than the improvements that we observed in our data, uh, which is a very, very welcome change from last year. Um, that said, uh, you know, there, there are a few exceptions, uh, sadly. Um, you know, first, after reducing its use of the death penalty uh, during the pandemic in 2020, uh, Saudi Arabia returned to its pre-pandemic levels uh, of the use of, of, of the death penalty, uh, which are among the highest observed in our data set. Uh, second, there's three countries that experienced pretty significant decreases in the right to assembly and association in 2021. Uh, Samoa uh, is one of them. Uh, I, I suspect uh, largely related to uh, uh, events around the highly contested elections that occurred there in 2021. Um, the United Kingdom, uh, with restrictions related once again to attempts to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And then, uh, as, as some of our panelists mentioned, Hong Kong, which continued uh, a very, very dramatic slide in its respect for empowerment rights uh, that we observed last year as well. Uh, and many of our respondents uh, ha have connected those declines to the passage of the national security law in Hong Kong. So speaking of Hong Kong, our panel just raised, you know, many interesting points about the China data. Since, since this is the first year we've had China in the civil and political rights data set, um, what stands out to you now that we have China's data alongside that of Hong Kong and Taiwan? Yeah, I mean, the most obvious finding is probably also, uh, as, as our panelists suggested, uh, one of the least, one of, one of, one of the most obvious is one of the least surprising, right? Um, and that's that the Chinese government's civil and political rights practices are among the worst in our data set. And based on what we know about, you know, our, the distribution of, of these kinds of practices around the world, probably around the worst in the world. Um, you know, their, their scores rank very near the bottom of our data on safety from the state. And they're basically in a statistical tie for the absolute lowest scores uh, on empowerment rights in the 2021 data. Uh, but similarly disheartening is the degree to which Hong Kong scores appear to be changing to converge with those that we observe in China. Um, since the passage of the national security law by the Beijing government in 2020, you know, Hong Kong scores for the rights to assembly and association, um, the right to opinion and expression, and the right to political participation are all significantly lower than they were in 2019. And at this point, those scores are estimated only to be slightly higher uh, than those for China. Uh, and, uh, you know, Hong Kong typically ranks in the bottom few countries in the, wor in the world, or at least in our data set on each of those things. Um, and I, I also find it interesting that, that there is a, a strong counterexample in the region in our data, and, and that, that's Taiwan, um, you know, which I, I think demonstrates that there's nothing about these poor practices that we're observing in China and Hong Kong that, that, that are predestined, right? Uh, Taiwan scores ranked near the top uh, of most of our civil and political rights metrics uh, with scores that 
look a whole lot more like the really high performing members of the Pacific region, uh, who once again, year after year, uh, uh, produce some of the highest scores uh, we observe in our data right there alongside South Korea. And as I said, Taiwan, um, like any, I, I want to be clear, though, like any country in our data set, Taiwan's not above critique. Uh, you know, unlike the vast majority of, of countries in our data set, Taiwan still maintains the death penalty and, and does still periodically execute people for committing capital offenses. Um, since I'm bringing up the death penalty, I suppose it, it makes sense to also talk about how uh, on this, Taiwan still compares quite favorably with the Chinese government, uh, which uses the death penalty to execute more people than any other country in our data set. And once again, uh, according to a lot of uh, external observer, or observers, probably executes more people than any country in the world. Um, further, there's some evidence that China, uh, the Chinese government, right, like Saudi Arabia also in our data, blurs the line between extrajudicial killings and the death penalty, uh, and potentially uses executions to eliminate those seen as political opponents to the state. And with the death penalty, you're also working on some new data on that front? Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, at, so at Hermie, we think it's really, really important to uh, measure freedom from the death penalty. Uh, the death penalty is banned in the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights. Uh, and many countries around the world have indeed banned its use, uh, but somehow in many countries like my own, uh, the United States, um, uh, the death penalty is maintained, right? Um, now, in those countries that maintain the death penalty, once again, I'm referring uh, uh, from personal experience in the United States, you know, talk about the death penalty is often, perhaps conveniently for that those countries, excluded from the human rights conversation. Uh, and and we, we think it's important that we bring that back in. And, and we think our current death penalty data are, are really useful um, for comparing countries on the number of people executed in any given year. Uh, but we're always looking for ways to improve our metrics. And so members of the CPR team, the, the civil and political rights team, uh, Meredith LaBelle uh, and Matt Raines, who you'll all hear from in just a moment, uh, as well as members of the Globus Human Rights Research Lab uh, at the University of Georgia have been working with me to, to complement our death penalty data with additional data on whether the death penalty is still legally retained in countries, the number of people who've been sentenced to death, uh, the number of people currently awaiting execution and other information. Um, we're going to talk more about that in coming months, but uh, uh, we hope to have new data to release on this front uh, before the end of the year, and, and we're really excited to, to continue developing them. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing um, what you come up with. And for those in the audience who are working to abolish the death penalty, um, do follow us on social media or sign up for our occasional email newsletters to make sure that you hear about these new developments. Um, now, Chad, uh, when we're talking about the death penalty, you mentioned your own country, the United States. Uh, you got a new president in 2021 and the legislature changed hands. Did that improve things? Sadly, no. Uh, I mean, the, the short answer is no. Um, as with every other year we've collected data for Hermi, the United States remains the worst performing high income democracy on both safety from the state and empowerment rights. Um, and it's the worst performing high income democracy on most of the individual rights we measure, not all, but most. Um, you know, there, there is some evidence that the United States may have slightly improved performance on the rights to assembly and association and on freedom uh, from arbitrary or political arrest. But I believe, you know, placing those in context, those changes can probably largely be attributed to uh, the removal of COVID restrictions uh, and a reduction in the intensity of protests compared to what we observe in 2020. Um, you know, the United States remains a country in which human rights violations disproportionately target and affect some people far more than others. Um, and under the Biden administration, we just haven't seen the reforms needed to end this kind of pervasive discrimination and abuse. Uh, they, they, those reforms just haven't happened. Um, so, you know, as, it, as of now, the U.S.'s scores remain abysmally low uh, for a high income democracy. Uh, thanks for that, Chad. Um, now, as you just said, we, we ask our respondents in the survey about how many people experience abuses, how common abuses are. Um, and we also ask respondents who is at risk for abuses, as um, our, my colleague showed on the rights tracker, and, um, and, and any extra context to abuses of particular rights. So to talk more about our people at risk and qualitative contextual data, um, we have our new civil and political rights measurement lead, Matt Raines. Uh, Matt, welcome. Um, since Chad ended with the United States, that seems like a good starting place. Uh, what can we learn from this year's Hermia data for the US? 
Well, Talia, uh, as Chad mentioned, the performance of the United States on our civil and political rights scores was not good. Um, and also, as Chad mentioned, uh, when you dig into our people at risk and qualitative data, it really demonstrates just how unequal human rights enjoyment really is in the United States. Uh, so respondents identified people of particular races, uh, refugees and asylum seekers, and migrants and immigrants as the least safe from state violence. Uh, most commonly identified was people of particular races, with 75% of respondents telling us they were at risk for torture, extrajudicial execution, and arbitrary arrest. Uh, and our qualitative data also provides additional insight. Uh, respondents were commonly listing people of color, uh, and in particular Black people, as being vulnerable to state violence, especially torture or execution. Um, respondents also mentioned migrants being targeted for violence in detention facilities and prisons, uh, with respondents noting secret detentions undertaken by immigration and customs enforcement. Uh, and this really leads to the central message that we sort of got out of it, which is that uh, if you are not white, uh, your most basic human rights are consistently at risk in the United States. So that's happening within our safety from the state rights. What about empowerment rights? Yeah, unfortunately, it's largely the same story when it comes to empowerment rights. Uh, for opinion and expression, assembly and association, and political participation, again, we have 75% of respondents uh, identifying people of particular races as being at risk. Uh, otherly common, other commonly selected groups, uh, we're looking at groups like detainees, uh, indigenous people, migrants and or immigrants, uh, and refugees and asylum seekers. In particular, respondents talked quite a bit uh, about protests demanding racial justice, so thinking particularly about Black Lives Matter demonstrations, for example, as the primary targets of authorities that are looking to limit or break up these public assemblies. Uh, and this is really stark when you compare it to predominantly white protests and demonstration uh, when they happen that, regardless of intent, really can operate without resistance in most cases. Uh, I'm particularly thinking about the events of January 6th, uh, you know, talking about the turnover to a new president, uh, where predominantly white assembly uh, attempted to halt democratic electoral processes and didn't really face significant resistance in doing so. Uh, and so we see largely the same message here, which is that if you're not white, uh, your civil and political rights are at risk in the United States. Right, so now let's come back to Hermes newest additions this year, starting with China. Um, what sort of stories did our people at risk and qualitative data tell about China in 2021 to add to the earlier discussion we've had? So China is one of the worst performers in our metrics and our people at risk data also demonstrates that. Uh, as an example for torture, every single one of our 39 people at risk categories was selected at least once, which really goes to show just how widespread ill treatment by government agents is. Uh, identities that fall into the general category of dissidents were commonly the most frequently identified by our respondents, uh, thinking about human rights advocates, uh, thinking about protesters, uh, you know, uh, thinking about those with particular political beliefs and workers' rights advocates, uh, as among the most commonly identified to be at risk for torture, uh, enforced disappearance and arbitrary arrest. Uh, China's targeting of minority ethnic groups also dominates our people at risk data, uh, with about half of our respondents noting that people of particular ethnicities and people with particular religious beliefs or practices as being at risk for extrajudicial execution, arbitrary arrest, forced disappearance, and torture. Uh, Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Kazakhs were all specifically mentioned very frequently. Uh, and then in terms of empowerment rights, uh, respondents most frequently said that everybody is at risk for rights abuse, uh, which is another demonstration of just how widespread non-enjoyment of political rights is. Uh, human rights advocates, protesters, and opposition members were also frequently identified as being at risk for non-enjoyments of the rights to assembly and association, opinion and expression, and political participation. Uh, independently formed organizations are just not allowed, and government is approval required. Gov government, excuse me, government approval is required for any civil society organization. Uh, you know, thinking about uh, protest or criticism at any level, uh, you're at risk uh, because even online spaces are closely monitored by agents of the state. Uh, if you're a lawyer who defends human rights defenders uh, or an opposition activist, you're also punished. 
uh, you know, uh, if you're a lawyer, you could lose your license to practice uh, or face infringement of your own rights. Uh, to be clear, anything less than full consent by the Chinese Communist Party means arrest, harassment by government officials, and violence at the hands of state security personnel. Uh, again, we have a very clear message from our respondents, which is that uh, nobody in China enjoys their political rights outside of a select few members of the political elite. Yeah, that's a pretty grim summary. It, it is, and what's particularly compelling is how many ways attempting to protest or organize independently uh, can ruin one's life in China. Uh, thinking specifically about uh, RSDL, or residential surveillance in a designated location, uh, which continues to be utilized for incommunicado detention of dissidents and human rights defenders, uh, which severs contacts to lawyers, families, and communities. Uh, connections to foreign actors or NGOs can be illegal under current law, putting defenders at risk. Uh, expression of opinions not approved by the Communist Party can lead to denial of health care, refusal of housing, and loss of employment, uh, not just for dissidents themselves, but also for their families. Uh, it really is true that lives can be and are ruined in China for daring to speak out. Oh, thanks for that, Matt. Um, now, now let's talk again about uh, India. What can we learn from Hermes people at risk and qualitative data on India? Sure. Uh, so for me, I think India was a bit of a surprise. Um, I think some people would expect that one of our categories, uh, people of particular cultural backgrounds or castes, would be the most frequent group identified in our people at risk, uh, you know, categories for India for uh, both safety in the state and empowerment. Uh, this was not the case for our safety from the state rights. Uh, we saw human rights advocates, people with particular religious beliefs, indigenous people, protesters, and occasionally journalists uh, being more frequently identified as at risk for torture, arbitrary arrest, and enforced disappearance. This isn't to say that people from scheduled castes and scheduled tribes were not uh, at risk. Both were still frequently mentioned by respondents, uh, but I was kind of surprised that other identities showed up more frequently. Uh, respondents also noted that certain laws and policies that, if protested against, really did put dissidents at particular risk. Uh, you know, particularly mentioned were individuals protesting the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, and farmers protesting the farm laws. For empowerment rights, uh, human rights advocates, people from particular cultural backgrounds or castes, uh, people with particular religious beliefs, protesters, and members of labor unions were all frequently identified as having their rights to assembly and association, opinion and expression, and political participation at risk. Uh, one's enjoyment of empowerment rights was, in many cases, conditioned on where you live and work. Uh, so respondents identified Citizenship Amendment Act protesters in Uttar Pradesh, uh, human rights advocates in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, and farmers in Punjab as all being at particular risk uh, for their right to assemble and associate. Um, so now for everyone in the audience who works to el eliminate caste-based discrimination and rights violations, we will be talking more about that in the future and uh, particularly at our economic and social rights data at a second event next week. Uh, Yoyo will put the registration info in the chat box for those who are interested in joining us then. Um, for a final question, Matt, let's sort of zoom out and get at trends happening globally. Uh, are there any shifts or patterns you've seen across our people at risk? Okay, um, yeah, uh, this is something that stuck out a little bit and really is sort of becoming more clear uh, with the more countries that we end up adding to our civil and political rights survey that we put out. Uh, one thing that really sticks out year after year is just the way that governments have been using bureaucracy and non-elected officials to hinder civil and political rights really across the board. Uh, China and India, both of our new additions serve as really stark examples of this. Uh, so we have India on one hand, who has used the process of naturalization and the Citizenship Amendment Act to limit per political participation of Muslim people uh, by offering this sort of exclusive citizenship ascension to religious minorities from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Uh, China has used legislation to introduce uh, other bureaucratic systems, uh, including subsequent denials of assemblies and uh, organizations as a consequence of this 1989 law on assemblies, processions, and demonstrations. Uh, and this usage of policy and non-elected officials 
it really does follow with data we've gotten from past years, uh, seeing where governments are using institutionalized denials or mechanisms of harassment to target people who are attempting to exercise their rights or seek redress from abuse. Uh, more and more, we're sort of seeing states that would rather deny an application for an assembly before it happens rather than abuse protesters during or after said assembly happens. Uh, it is an unfortunately effective strategy, uh, and it's something that we as the human rights community are going to need to draw more attention to and find more ways of dealing with in the future. Thanks, Matt. Um, there's lots to keep contemplating there. So please, everybody, take a good look through the rights tracker and feel free to get in touch with any of us um, at any time to discuss it. And uh, do put questions in the Q&A box um, if there's things that you'd like us to come back to. Um, now we're going to check in with Hermie co-founder Anne-Marie Brook, also here in New Zealand, to talk about what's next uh, for you all and for us. Um, Anne-Marie, today we, we launch the data, that's the metaphor we're using, uh, just like you might launch a ship into the ocean. Um, now ships aren't supposed to just sit in the water looking pretty, they're supposed to go places. So Anne-Marie, where are some of the places you are hoping our data go to from today? Where will they be sailing? Who might be steering them to an important destination? Thanks, Talia. So we want our data to go all over the world in as many different vessels as possible. So the image I have in mind is more the release of our product, which is human rights data, on an entire flotilla of vessels, which head off to their respective destinations. So all of our viewers here today have the potential to be steering one of those vessels. I mean, one thing I really like to remind people is that Hermie is not an advocacy organization. We don't take our data ourselves to governments around the world and try to convince them that they could do more to improve the lives of their people. That's not our role. Our role is to produce the data in a really independent and robust way um, and collaboratively, and then encourage others to use them in advocacy and in, and, and in other ways that can help improve the lives of people. Right, so you're saying that any one of our webinar participants here today or listening online um, in the future, um, they can think of themselves as the vessels that are taking these data we're launching out into the world. Absolutely. Some of them might be like massive ships with international reach and lots of resources at their disposal. Others may be operating more at a local or national level with much more modest resources. Some of our participants here today might be riding the waves of the ocean in a lone kayak. We want to make our data useful to everyone, not only to the existing global human rights community, but also to people who don't normally look at the world through a human rights lens. Now let's talk more about that. In particular, can you tell us more about some of the sort of bigger and better resourced vessels who are not yet using HUMI data, but soon will be? Well, um, that would be institutional investors and private sector companies. The demand for human rights data from the private sector is huge. Investors and consumers are demanding that firms take better account of human rights. You know, and just to think about this particular example, investors in Russian bonds this year have taken a big hit. And this has really made them sit up and pay more attention to the risks of investing in countries that are poor human rights performers. So I would say the only reason that many of these organizations are not already using Hermie data is because we don't yet have full global coverage with our civil and political rights data. So that's gonna change soon? Uh, yes and no. So yes, for these private sector organizations, because Chad and his team um, have developed a methodology that can allow us to produce a full set of high level civil and political rights data for all countries in the world, even before we have the funding to expand the survey to to all of them. Of course, the data that we produce for the countries where we're not yet running the survey will be lower quality, but it will still be much better than what these firms already have access to. And as our funding grows, we will keep expanding the survey and the data quality will keep rising. And can you say more about how you think this new data set will be used by private sector organizations? So there's many use case examples, but let me just give you two. So first, I mentioned investors in Russian bonds just before. Our new data set will be extremely useful for ESG sovereign bond investors, either to inform their country exclusions policy 
or for tilting uh, their country allocation rates so that they can invest slightly like more in countries that are doing well on human rights and less in countries that are doing poorly. This is the data that sovereign ESG investors really need. Uh, second example is companies who are making decisions about where to locate their factories or where to source their inputs from. Uh, they will need good information about human rights practices in each of the source countries that they are considering. No firm wants to end up on the front page of the Financial Times being critiqued for not properly managing the risks in their supply chain. And just one other thing I'd like to mention, uh, we are currently in the process of organising a summit for September with the theme engaging the private sector in advancing human rights. So if anyone is listening to this and would like to learn more about that or potentially participate in the summit, please reach out to me. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Um, now, whatever kind of use you might have for our data, we are here to help. We at Hermi really enjoy helping people understand our data and figure out how to use it in their own work. Um, so please do get in touch with me if you have questions or if you'd like us to run a workshop for your team or perhaps help you with um, writing a report or submission um, that you want to you know, bolster with some more data. So my email address will be in the chat box. Um, we also have several uh, workshops recorded already on our YouTube channel in several different languages, so please make use of those resources too. Now we're nearly at the end of our prepared session, um, section, so let me remind you that you can keep up with our work anytime by following us on social media um, and signing up for occasional email newsletters. They really only happen a few times a year, so we won't be spamming you. Um, the details are, again are in the chat box. Um, we're, we're open for questions. Um, we've been answering some along the way as we go, and uh, I don't think we have a backlog right now. Um, so what we're going to do now is um, just acknowledge that our work is the product of hundreds of people's contributions. Um, so I'd like to just show you um, some of the, the people um, who, who help us do our work. Um, these are some of our country ambassadors um, around the world. Now, many of our ambassadors can't be named or pictured, uh, but here are some of them. Um, and I just wanted to give us a chance to, um, to reflect on all the people uh, that you know and that we know, um, and the ones that we don't, who are working hard right now to make the world a better place, um, to advance human rights and to improve people's lives. So let's just take a moment in silence um, to contemplate um, some faces of uh, some of the people who work with Kumi, and you can think of the people that you know in your life um, who are working hard um, to help make the world better and kinder and fairer. And with that, I'd like to um, offer my very sincere thanks to our guests today, to the Hermi team who were able to share their knowledge, um, and to all of you who joined us and um, shared a significant portion of your day with us um, as we all work together uh, to um, put uh, more tools into people's hands who are working to improve people's lives around the world. Um, please do keep in touch um, and uh, uh, let us know if there's any way that we can help you. And now I'll draw the webinar to a close. Thank you.